So if we're gonna take one of BMW's most complex and unreliable cars and make it more unreliable, then we may as well just go all out. Welcome to Couch Built, where we aim to both create and solve most of our automotive build problems in the digital space before we go and turn those mistakes into reality. But first, you're probably wondering, who is this guy and why is he up in my notifications? If you're a current subscriber to this channel, then you probably found it through my Tesla-powered E30 BMW. While I've since parted ways with that car, that build brought to light what a powerful performance tool that an electric platform could offer. However, not without its shortcomings, I decided that my next build would be a hybrid powertrain to combine the best of both worlds. The i8 was BMW's technological flagship when it was released in 2014, with a 1.5 liter turbocharged internal combustion motor in the rear and a 141 horsepower electric motor up front, making the car all-wheel drive and bringing the total combined power output to around 360 horsepower. While the performance was on par with M cars of the day, it didn't quite match the looks or its $150,000 price tag. The aftermarket never provided much support either, and if you spend any time on Facebook i8 groups, which I suggest you don't, you'll see why. The most common topic of discussion is which extended warranty to buy. But 10 years later, you have a massively depreciated car with a carbon fiber chassis, capable suspension, efficient aero, and doors that go up. If you're looking for the next best alternative, checking all those boxes, you'll probably be spending McLaren money. At the end of the day, we have a bargain supercar wannabe that we can fix those performance shortcomings with a little engineering of our own. The original plan for the car was to utilize the three-cylinder internal combustion motor that comes installed from the factory. That is the B38, which is the three-cylinder version of the B48, which is the four-cylinder version of the B58 six-cylinder found in a bunch of newer BMWs, as well as the new Supra. That platform has demonstrated the ability to make some impressive power per cylinder, which should translate directly down to the B38, only at 50% of the uh, max output of its six-cylinder counterpart. However, the three-cylinder has some things like a balance shaft with the last number coupled gears, and quite possibly one of the worst cooling systems installed in a newer BMW that we'd have to re-engineer to make the juice quite not worth the squeeze. So if we're gonna take one of BMW's most complex and unreliable cars and make it more unreliable, then we may as well just go all out. This is where we install a 13B REW from an FD RX-7. That will be backed by a DQ500 seven-speed dual sequential gearbox found in the Audi RS3. All of that will integrate in such a way that we're gonna to try to retain as much of the BMW hybrid functionality as we possibly can. While this might be the first video that you're seeing on the topic, I've been doing a lot of the development work on this project in the background over the past few months working out the positioning of major components and designing the induction system around it. So why don't we take a jump on over to Fusion 360 and we'll take a look to see what we got so far. So we've got a 3D scan of most of the car. This was done with a Shining 3D Einstar, which is a pretty fantastic scanner for the money. And I might do a video about that in the future, but there's plenty of information that you can go and locate yourself on the topic. So let's go ahead and get rid of the body. So by some amazing good fortune, I was provided a pretty high quality 3D scan of the factory subframe motor and transmission, which pretty much fast tracked this project um, and saved me from having to go find an i8 that was already disassembled for a fairly common motor replacement due to the absolutely poor cooling system that can be found in, uh, in this car. The first thing that I did was to design and fabricate an exhaust which already exists in reality. The exhaust itself is made of two 
Borla Pro XS mufflers in series, as well as a Helmholtz resonator that is tuned to get rid of some um, drone and boominess at 105 and 140 hertz. And then as you can see from the positioning of the support bracket, that uh, the scan was actually really accurate. This um, all bolted up without any issues and uh, fit right in the car like a glove. So good stuff. But that's enough with the factory stuff. We're talking about a motor swap. So let's get rid of our downpipe and drop in our 13B. And right from the get-go, you can see that the 13B is almost entirely enveloped by the three-cylinder. Uh, poking through a bit on the back and obviously sits a little bit lower with the oil pan. But other than that, you have a ton of space on the top side that we're going to have room for activities and that's going to get filled up pretty quick. So let's get rid of that. We will add our adapter plate in and drop in our DQ500. And from here you can see that the the new transmission will be pretty much the same amount of space as the, the factory six speed. Uh, we do get a little bit closer to the frame rail here, but we still have enough clearance that it is not a concern. It's also notable that the uh, mounting positions are very close to the factory mount and the, uh, the DQ500. And if we bring the mounts in, you can see that we can utilize the same factory mounting points on the subframe. And then over on the right side, if we bring the V38 back in, you can see that the 13B motor mount lines up exactly with the factory V38 mount. And we're going to uh, reuse the factory rubber mount that uh, mates up with that gap in the subframe right there. All right, so let's get rid of this. And then speaking of filling up space on the top side, most of that will be occupied by our intake manifold. This is going to feature an air-to-water intercooler, a Bosch 68mm drive-by-wire throttle body, and six injectors. This will also have a flex fuel sensor, even though we do not have E85 readily available here in Connecticut. I would like to have the option to run that in the future. Uh, this is going to run off of a max ECU, primarily because it has a ton of flexible CAN bus options and also native support of the DQ500 transmission, which makes things um, super easy. You'll also notice on the back side here, we've got four IGN1A ignition coils, and we also have a canister style oil filter housing that I designed that uses a uh, BMW. N54 oil filter so we can also allow us to change the oil from the top side and not dribble oil all down the side of our motor like we would potentially on an upside down oil filter like is found on the 13B from the factory. So we had to get a little creative with the motor mount because the 13B was never designed to be hung from the front plate and we basically have a giant chunk of CNC aluminum that's going to pick up off of five M8 fasteners. Um, that's also going to double as our coolant inlet and outlet ports, which are going to be tapped for 6-16 six, six uh, O-ring fittings. And then if we bring our cooling system in, it'll be fed from the factory tubes that run under the car through the motor to a Pierberg uh, CWA 400 pump and then fed back up to the front of the car to the radiator. Uh, with the electric water pump, that's going to fix one of the primary issues with the B38. Out of all the technology and complexity that they built into the car, they decided to use a mechanical water pump of all things. And there's also no place to bleed the air on the top of the motor. so. You basically have to go through a procedure of turning the motor on, bringing it up to a specified RPM, shutting it off, repeating the procedure with increasing RPM to try to get the air to bleed out of the system, all while you try to um, pre-fill it with a vacuum. 
but in here we're going to be able to run the electric water pump to put coolant through the system and while i haven't added in yet i'm going to put a channel up through here to have a port to bleed air off at the top of the motor mount which will allow the air to escape the highest point and facilitate that bleeding a little bit quicker uh, from there let's take a look at our turbo kit so we've got a Borg Warner EFR 8374. That has this long inlet tube, which is going to be 3D printed out of SLS nylon. Uh, there's going to be a lot of 3D printing on this, if you couldn't tell by the organic shapes on the intake manifold and the turbo manifold. Uh, these aren't going to be done with uh, traditional cut and weld fabrication methods. So there's going to be a, a lot of info on that coming up, uh, so stay tuned for that. You might notice there is kind of an odd organic shape on the inlet pipe, and that is to clear a protrusion that's on the rear subframe that we can see right here. And one of the stipulations on this build is I wanted to do everything completely plug and play, no cutting of the chassis. I wanted to work with the space that I had and make it installed just as it would from the factory. Not to say that these cars uh, will ever become collector's items or if I ever care about resale value, but there is something to be said for the challenge of working with the space that you've got and not just hacking away to achieve your desired outcome. That inlet pipe is going to be fed by an airbox with a fairly large panel filter. Uh, the airbox will also have a provision for a temperature map sensor. So that's going to feed our ambient air temperature, and then we can also measure to see if there's any sort of vacuum being generated post-air filter to understand how efficient our intake is. Speaking of TMAP sensors, the intake manifold will have two of them, so we can measure both pre- and post-intercooler temperature, as well as any pressure drop that we might see and understand efficiencies there. So we've got a nice large inlet to our air box. And then if we pull our exterior mesh back in, you'll see there's a large scoop that's fed by some ducts in the side skirts. And then we will be designing a new intermediate duct that will have much larger volume to, to feed our, our larger air box. That way we're not going to choke off our hungry uh, EFR compressor housing. So an interesting aspect about the i8 is that in addition to the electric motor up front, there's a second electric motor bolted to the internal combustion engine, and that functions as a starter. It also functions as a generator to charge the high voltage battery, and also acts as an electric supercharger that uh, can output uh, something like 20 or 30 horsepower which is going to be really interesting to see if we can get that to work and help supplement our uh, low end and turbo spool. If we bring the B38 back into view, you'll see just how close the positioning on the 13B is to the factory location, so much so that we will not have to modify any of the cooling lines, any of the high voltage lines. Everything is going to remain untouched from the factory and bolt right to the 13B, which should be pretty neat if uh, we can sort out all the electronic side of things. And then to make that work, to design an eight rib crank pulley that's of the same diameter as the one on the B38 that has a 60 minus two trigger wheel. And then we're gonna use that with a, a ZF Hall effect sensor to uh, feed our max ECU. Bouncing around a bit, the turbo has a BMW electric wastegate. So that's going to allow us fully electronic control of its position. We can leave it fully open if we want to. And one concern people have seen with some of the internal gates is boost creep. But with the drive-by-wire throttle body, that's not really a concern because if we have the wastegate fully open, 
and we're still generating enough boost that it's a problem, then we can just simply add a modifier table to our throttle control and dial back our throttle position based on the boost level. So um, we can easily compensate for that with, uh, with some tuning. And if we start to rebuild our assembly here with the subframe, and then we bring back our exterior mesh, and then the interior portion. We can see that the air box and air filter will be easily accessible. Our oil filter housing is easily accessible as well. And I still have yet to design the oil filler for the sump and then have to figure out some sort of uh, catch can situation. So that's it for now. Uh, thanks for watching and hope you stick around for the next episode where we will find out what $900 of eBay mystery motor buys. See you next time.